Facebook. Um, and so thank you so much for joining me, Jewel Jones. Um, so I just want to give a little introduction. Um, Quick to po Politic is the social commentary show. I'm your host, Ernestine Lyons. And um, so today I'm going to be joined by uh, State Representative Jewel Jones, uh, who is serving his second term. Is that right? Second? Uh, representing the 11th House District, which comprises of Garden City, Inkster, um, portions of Dearborn Heights, Livonia, Westland. And um, so you previously served on uh, Communications and Technology and Regulatory Reform, Military and Veterans Affairs Committees. Um, and prior to being on, in the House of Representatives, uh, Jewel was also a member of Inkster City Council. Um, and you, you also work in law enforcement, you served in the armed forces, um, and you're really an inspiration, I think, um, to, to a lot of young black boys out there. So I'm really excited to have you on the show and, um, we are super, um, happy to, to have you here. Oh, and it looks like you might be frozen. Oh, nope. Okay. We got you. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about, about yourself. Did we miss anything? Okay. So thank you um, and welcome back. Um, we were having some technical difficulties. This is Quick to Politic. We are live here with Jewel Jones. And um, we had just talked about your background and all of these wonderful things. Um, state representative for the 11th district representing you know, the wonderful communities of Garden City, Inkster, Airborne Heights, Livonia, Westland. Um, and you know, just, just an inspiration and somebody who is very influential in uh, the community and in Michigan politics. So my question was, uh, why politics at so young? So what was it that at 21 years old, you know, you became the youngest person elected to the House of Representatives and then, you know, being on Gardens, or not, not Garden City, but Inkster City Council uh, prior to that, and you were even younger then. So what was it that made politics the thing that you wanted to do with your young life and make an impact that way? Right. You know, I think uh, I think we're just transferring to this humans. And so when I was younger, I was in college, and you know, I heard a lot of people telling me, like, hey, you should run for city council. It's my hometown. I grew up out there, did a lot of work with uh, a lot of the folks that lived out there and even surrounding communities because my parents always kept us, you know, me and my sister. My sister and I active and involved. Uh, in church and in the community. And so once you know, they kind of see me matriculate through the process, I mean, they told me to run. I was a sophomore in college. I thought it'd be pretty cool to be able to get back. And I had tried it out uh, with my partner, Javion Johnson, um, who at the time uh, was my campaign manager. And when we had one, it just triggered a whole roller coaster of events, you know, and, and that's when everything else came. But it was never like it was a dream of mine. Um, I tell people all the time I want to be a spy back in the day. And so um, the politics kind of just happened, you know. Wait, did you just say a spy? Like like with the yeah. uh, that? I wanted to be a spy. <laughs> that was always my dream, too. I wanted to work for the Central Intelligence Agency. And I actually, uh, in college, was a part of the Center of Academic Excellence in National Security and Intelligence Studies. And it was, like, preparing you for a life in, you know, working for the CIA or the FBI. And, you know, I think that's kind of, that's, that's interesting. I didn't know that, um, you know, as far as, so what is your vision for, like, continuing to bring, like, inspiration to the next generation of, like, millennial leaders? I know that you had started um, a program called Neighborhood Hope Dealers, and you had, like, a lot of folks who were, you know, a part of this, and, you know, you were hoping to, you know, to, to mentor, like, what what if, what continues with that, and um, what are your your plans for continuing to help the you know the next generation of leaders who want to you know step up and not just talk about it but be about it? Right, right, yeah. That was the hope institute. We had started a while back, and initially had a whole lot of like folk, and then I tried to weed through to get a smaller crowd, but it still became I would say kind of burdensome just to kind of. Uh, keep up with the everything I had going on. They're trying to mentor at the same time, so I'm finding the sweet spot for that right now. And I think it's super important for us to, you know, in terms of sustainability, in terms of succession planning, um, just to have people that's in the pipeline ready to go, and also just to build a team where everyone can be, you know, leaders in their own aspect. You know, everyone doesn't have to be in politics. We have 
um, business leaders, we have athletic leaders, we have spiritual leaders. And so um, the Hope Institute um, eventually will be something that's going to be a, a way to create catalysts to help speed people through the process um, when they really want to do great things and they're at a young age. Um, but, you know, the, the, the overall vision, though, is really just to to provide opportunities for people great access. I think that's what we all need whenever someone gets the opportunity that they can really knock it out. Uh, but they have to at least be able to get into that door. And that's all we want to do is get out for us, provide resources. That's how we get into that next level where they need to be. That's that's really that's really cool and it's inspirational. And you talk about, you know, the Hope Institute providing opportunities for, for folks to have a way forward when there is lack of some of those opportunities. Um, that kind of makes me pivot into uh, maybe a more tough question. Um, you know, the usage of the term black on black crime to describe violence in the black community and movements around anti-racism. Um, I know we had right. talk about some of these things. Um, some of your recent public comments um, have kind of mentioned behavior of black people kind of contributing to police brutality. Um, and I wanted to say that, you know, to me, I think black on black crime is a misnomer. Um, because, you know, other groups are not necessarily, you know, their entire racial group isn't responsibility, of, isn't responsible for the behavior of individuals and other groups and their failures, uh, their failures and their irresponsibility, they don't tarnish the entire group. So in some ways, you know, I think the term is rooted in a deep sense of, you know, of systemic and problematic injustice and um, you know in this country and you know it, it just kind of it points to a misnomer that plays into the radicalization of how you know black crime is viewed versus crime being crime so what are what are your thoughts on you know that and you know how can we really change the dialogue on putting responsibility on you know an entire group of people to you know, mitigate and change, you know, behaviors of one person. But then when you even look at the behaviors of one individual person, you see that, you know, that is not indicative of how the entire group is, you know, presented. And, you know, I really think that, you know, we can, we can definitely do better as far as this negative stereotype that persists out there um, and getting to the heart of the real issue, which is, systemic injustice and lack of opportunity and lack of resources. Right. And I, and I, and I agree with everything you said uh, as well, except for, I just want to clarify, um, none of my comments said anything about the behavior of black people contributing to police brutality. The, the whole idea was really just trying to spark a conversation on if that, uh, the picture that I shared was actually relevant. And I think people took that in a lot of different directions. Um, but I would have to say that I do believe that black on black crime is a thing. Of course, you have systemic, um, I guess, things and archaic things that actually uh, contribute to police brutality occurring and other other forms of crime. But I think when we talk about adjectives and we're talking about grammar, simply um, just using words and describing situations that black on black crime is actually a thing because of a black person commits a crime against another black person that's black on black crime. If a white person doesn't get another white person, that's white on white crime. Sure, we can say crime, but if we like to go into detail about it um, and just paint it um, in a way where we can paint it very simply, I think that black and black crime is extremely relevant and it's an easy way to describe a situation. Of course, they, there are, it's pro, it can become problematic, but I don't think that is something that we have to dismiss just because um, it, it becomes problematic uh, when we bring it up in different conversations. But what I would say about all of that stuff, I think that... Um, especially in terms of police brutality piece, a lot happens um, because you have different things like community clauses, you know, you have different ways that officers are insured through cities. And if they do something, they're not really going to, you know, their self, or if they do do something, they know they'll be protected. And so it's different ways uh, from a policy standpoint that you can go ahead and, and create some kind of reform or amend these things. Um, but just the current appetite of our government right now, I don't really see it happening in a lot of communities. And so this is the key why we have to figure out how do we really build a sense of community amongst uh, people of color, and namely black people, and how do we get people more civically engaged in the process so where they can become matched to their community, um, running the political, economic, and social structures that are you know present in their own communities instead of allowing other people to do so. 
Um, I think that's really the key at the end, of, the end of the day. And that's why I'm happy that, which I'm sure you're familiar with, our Black Party, which was recently launched. Um, they're all about uh, prioritizing Black people and the Black agenda. And I think we need more of that, more of those conversations. Um, right now, not, not, not only with the correct, not only with Republicans, but also with Democrats. So tell us more about where you can find information on our Black Party and so like folks can follow it on, you know, uh, the Internet and what role you've had to do uh, with, with this movement. And because I know you're involved in a lot of things um, and because this is this is uh, relatively new um, to me, um, but I'd love to hear more about, you know, just this movement and, you know, getting more educated on some of these these issues that are more proactive. Right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, our Black Party can follow it uh, online, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. Black Party. Um, you can go online at ourblackparty.org um, to sign up on the platform. Um, and I think, like a Republican, you are Black. And Black are politics. Wait, I think uh, I heard um, a little bit of that, and then it started breaking up. Can you hear me now? Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, so, I mean, with the, as far as the party goes, so uh, it's just yet a registered political party, but we are exploring those different options. I was basically birthed um, out of a caucus that contains, you know more than 300 black elected officials, young black elected officials, um, but also um, alongside of, you know, people in the music industry, professional athletes, um, you know, clergy, like spiritual leaders, um, young activists, and even just, you know, just school, school age people, you know, any, anybody that has anything to do with, uh, any, anybody that has anything to do with the movement, has anything to do with our to join. And, I think that this is going to be something that we've all been waiting for, and it can help prevent a blood a blood uh, shed revolution. Because I believe this can contribute to us having a bloodless revolution in the United States, uh, where we actually uh, put people before, you know, uh, we actually put people before other things that have been taking precedent um, and harming our communities. <laughs> For, for like shedding light on that. And um, I just kind of want to pivot into um, another question that um, I, I've been reading about one notable bill that um, you had been working on that, that would change um, sort of juvenile defenders, you know, being sentenced as adults and giving sort of, um, you know, young people a chance because young people don't think the same way that adults do. They, they right. kind of act irrationally their little brains are still formulating and they're they're not necessarily going to make the best decisions all the time so you know to really have them sentenced as adults I don't think it's necessarily fair to to the rest of their lives for them to suffer you know because of and you know they're of course you know African Americans are going to be disproportionately sentenced um, as adults uh, compared to their white peers um, and there's a lot of research out there around this um, so what sort of other reforms do you want to see um, in the nation and in the state of Michigan in particular? And um, to follow up with that, um, what do you plan to do differently, like for, for you know, this term compared to this term? And, you know, what do you plan to keep the same as far as the momentum that you, you've had as a state representative? Well, what I would definitely say, I think, you know, uh, legislation and, you know, around reparations definitely is becoming a hot topic. And, and trying to figure out what that looks like for our people, I believe is going to be something that definitely needs to be talked about and needs to be dealt with. Um, not necessarily saying, hey, let's pass a check out to everyone that's black, but um, let's create some kind of resources. Let's create some kind of equitable uh, resources where, you know, someone wants to start a business, they have opportunities and resources to do so. Someone wants to um, do something in their communities, they have the resources to do so. Someone wants to go to school and study, um, they have the, the opportunity and access to do so. Um, so I definitely think drilling down on that conversation would be critical, um, especially here in Michigan. I definitely would love to see auto insurance reform, actual reform, uh, revolutionary reform. I think we've done a lot of little um, fixes in the past to auto insurance, but it hasn't really solved the problem of redlining, rename things. You know, that's something that people are very good at, technical fixes. When we're talking about legislation. They might call it zip codes, territories, and still be able to charge people, you know, 
ridiculous rates because of territories that they live in. And so I think, you know, everyday issues is what we need to be discussing more. But for that to happen, we have to get more everyday people in office, more people that actually are living in the neighborhoods that are experiencing the problems. And even if not having them in office, at least having them involved in the conversations um, that we're having when we're piecing together legislation, I think would be critical. Um, right, right. I think it, it is really important to have, you know, um, just an engaged community. And I think that's that's kind of why I started, you know, this, this podcast slash, you know, web series that, you know, we talk with our community, talk about issues that are, you know, that range the gamut. And, and you know, it's really important to be able to, to encourage, you know, everybody to realize they have agency and they, they can be a part of the solution, whether you, you know, went to get fancy degrees from somewhere and, you know, in policy, or if you're just a regular person, you still have a share in, you know, opportunity and you still have a share in having a say out there in, you know, just political discourse with regard to legislation and, you know, asking for what you want and coming to reach out to folks like yourself and me and, you know, telling us, you know, what you want to see. So um, thank you. Thank you for, for answering that question about, you know, just, just, the future and you know how you want to you know, change things and um, what's the status of um, the the bill you were working on? I'm not sure if you could, you could share much about it, but you know just you know, defenders and you know I think that's really admirable um, to to really advocate for you know young folks who you know need they need their their electeds to to do more for for them. Right. Well, that bill has been introduced currently. Um, it'll be going to a committee pretty soon. And so that's where we'll basically get into the details, figure out uh, what needs to be added, what needs to be uh, removed or what needs to be amended. And from that point, we'll be moving to the House floor. Um, now, every piece of legislation that's been introduced really since, the, you know, since the world fell apart earlier this year has kind of been um, slow motion just because most of the efforts, most of the dollars even around the budget have been committed to coronavirus relief or, or to things that are dealing with uh, making life back as normal as possible um, during the current pandemic. And so a bill like that to some might not seem very relevant um, during, during the COVID-19 um, crisis, but I think that it's still true because we still have people that are incarcerated, people that are still going through trials, people that still might find themselves in courts uh, where this, this kind of legislation will help them out. And so it's, it's been introduced, but once we go to the committee, uh, we'll be rock and rolling on the process. I'm sure you may know that lame duck is coming up, which is the conclusion of a full legislative session. And typically when that happens, um, there's a, a huge opportunity to get a lot of legislation passed, a lot of um, budgetary items uh, inputted uh, just because people are on their way out. So a lot of negotiations happen, a lot of compromises happen. So we'll see... Um, where that piece of legislation falls uh, with everything else that we, we wrap up this year. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. And, um, you know, I just, just wishing for the best and hoping that, you know, everything just passes and, you know, um, sounds like a lot of uh, hard work went into this. And so, so to, and with closing, um, for one of our final questions here, um, I really wanted to kind of delve into um, what kind of advice you would be, you know, wanting to give for, you know, really, it's more of a two part question, really, I want to know more about how the future is going to be shaped by, you know, the Coronavirus pandemic. And, you know, just now that we've heard musings about the potential of a vaccine, and something that could be available as far as November, whether or not the United States opts into it or not, that remains right. to be seen. But, um, you know, we've, we've lived with COVID for six months and we have had, you know, some of these, these heartbreaking sort of, uh, you know, the deaths that have come out of it. And, you know, whether you think it was, it was well handled or you think it was disastrously handled, um, I think it has really been trying for the nation as a whole and for Michigan. Um, so where, how do you see the I think it's something going on with your with your mic, maybe. Nope. I, okay. I, if you if it was getting moved or something was hitting it, I didn't hear everything. I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. 
Um, so, so I was saying that um, pretty much like, what do you think the future is going to be for, you know, us as a society? We've gone through this pandemic, which is really trying. And, you know, will we come together? Will we restructure? Will we recognize that there were a lot of disparities and a lot of, you know, problems with our underlying structure that was writ large? Or do you think we'll go back to, you know, just business as usual um, and, and change for the better? Or will it be a new type of society as we move into the, into the 2020s and a whole new decade awaits us on the other, you know, end of this? Right. Well, I think, I think that's really going to, you know, time will, time will tell us how that's going to happen, basically because um, the key right now is that, you know, we kind of see, like, even for example, we see, we see even for example that um, you know when the, when the pandemic first started, uh, they basically started printing money. You know when when they wanted to pass out stimulus, of course, about reparations for years, and for years, you know everyone's wondering like, where are we gonna get the money for? You know from we've talked about the Flint crisis for years. Where are we gonna get the money from? Um, and we realize how robust the federal government can be um, when all lives are at stake. And so um, just in terms of you know, black lives, you know, speaking very plainly. I think that now we've seen what's possible and uh, it's important for us to hold um, the government accountable to make sure that life doesn't go back to normal after we um, get out of this pandemic. Um, but that really is going to be up to up to the people to determine um, if that happens. Are we going to still allow the same people to be in office? Are we gonna, still going to allow the same people to, you know, uh, are we still going to allow the same people to, um, control the narrative. I think we lost your volume. I heard I, I lost you at control the narrative. Can you hear me now? Okay, perfect. You can hear me now. I can hear you now. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, you were at control the narratives. It allowed the same people to control the narrative. Right, and so that, that's where I was. That's where I was basically ending in that though. Like we have to make sure that we don't allow the same people to control the narrative. We don't need the same people to um, continue to try to run the show. Uh, we have to get more people involved that are, are going to actually um, keep our interests at heart. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to wrap here. Um, I've been keeping the click to politics short. Um, and thank you so much for joining and thank you for, you know, telling us about your story and, you know, um, you know, just kind of me pushing you a little bit and challenging you on some of the, some of the we're going to agree to disagree on the, the terminology and the, right. as you said, semantics. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that there's definitely, um, it, it's, there's a lot of work as far as, you know, just kind of, even as we reevaluate and reassess where we are as far as like challenging, you know, our systems and challenging each other, I think there's a lot of different discourse and different, different dialogues. Um, that are had, needed to be had. So thank you once again, um, everybody. This has been Jewel Jones. Um, thank you so much for coming on. This has been Quick to Politic. And um, thanks for, for, for doing what you do and being out there in, in the service of this country. I appreciate you. Looking forward to talking to you again soon. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.